Russia has been a major force in the Middle East. Did something change yesterday? We have different guests from different countries to talk about this. Yusuf Lurin from Turkey, Dr. Marwa Maziad uh, with the Egyptian angle tonight. Amir Oren is uh, here in the studio with the Israeli angle. Yusuf, I'd like to start with you. The view from Turkey. Well, when we look at uh, the events uh, in Russia that unfolded over the last 24 hours, uh, it's definitely something that uh, concerned Turkey. And when we look at the Turkish president's phone call with his Russian counterpart, Vladimir Putin, uh, he expressed that uh, they were ready to support the Russian leadership uh, in any which way possible, that they wanted to see this matter resolved in a calm and collected manner going forward. Now, whenever you have a neighbor nation uh, when there's some type of military activity that's uh, not sanctioned by the state. I don't know if we should call it a uh, coup d'etat exactly or an insurrection, something in between, I think. Uh, this is definitely a great cause for concern, especially in the Middle East, because instability, unfortunately, is like a communicable disease. And when that instability could arise in a country that's armed to the teeth with nuclear weapons, yes, this does cause a lot of concern. So. Uh, Turkey was very concerned with what happened yesterday. It was very, very closely following the situation. Uh, did Russia lose anything yesterday? I think only time will tell. I think it's way too early right now to be able to analyze uh, what Russia gained or lost from the situation yesterday. But uh, it definitely caused a lot of concern, not just only in Turkey, I think, throughout the greater Middle East, uh, the Balkans, the uh, Black Sea region, Central Asia, anyone who was in close proximity to Russia was definitely concerned with what happened yesterday. But I think the results, at least for the time being, seem to have calmed down. It seems to be a resolution, and it's probably the best resolution for the countries in uh, the hinterland of the former so uh, Soviet Union geography. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll speak about uh, Syria as well later, maybe. Uh, Marwa, your point of view? Well, I think, um, you know, the, as a professor of civil military relations, this is really a case where um, the role of the state, as opposed to any paramilitary groups uh, that the state might have created at some point, come to the forefront. And I think uh, a country like Egypt or Turkey or Israel, for that matter, all these uh, Middle Eastern countries are very concerned when any kind of militias, any kind of armed groups, whether sanctioned by the state at some point or not, uh, start to initiate these kind of uh, uh, mutiny or, uh, 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 you know, stand up to the state in the way the Wagner group leader did. Uh, so I would say that the Egyptian uh, case is just like uh, the other countries in the region uh, where they will support the state. Uh, Putin in, 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 as a representative of that, because Egypt in particular is against any kind of armed groups, armed militias. And we saw that in Sudan as well. I think the situation is almost a, a template of some sort. The Hamiti was the uh, leader of this paramilitary group uh, who was created by the state and then that kind of impasse and we saw where that led to some to severe instability and concerns even on the border of Egypt so I think with this kind of repeat of a scenario of some sort uh, in Russia definitely the the Egyptian state the Egyptian leadership uh, will wait and watch but with, with what happened it seems like even in that situation reached a better resolution now that the Wagner leader kind of went to Belarus and they're sorting it out. So mm. uh, Egypt has a similar position from what we heard from Turkey, I would say. Right. Uh, Amir, following on, on this point, uh, maybe some leaders in the Middle East are more nervous today? Maybe they are. Of course, um, each dictator must look around, even though uh, Putin's uh, inner circle, his security forces, his personal guard, they uh, stood uh, by him. Uh, they did not uh, join Prigozhin, as uh, some people feared. Uh, the veterans of the Ukraine war, much like the veterans of the Afghan invasion in the 1980s who came back to Moscow and helped Gorbachev uh, undertake uh, 
uh, perestroika and glasnost and eventually disintegrate the Soviet Union. They may play a part because they are embittered and disillusioned. And um, uh, this is a lesson for many uh, leaders not uh, to undertake uh, capricious adventures. Okay. Now, about the Israeli angle, uh, some in Israel um, say it's about time to reconsider policies towards the Ukraine war. Uh, the Ukraine is very disappointed in Israel. How is this going to play? So, so the Ukrainian embassy in Israel um, has issued a very strong statement um, today condemning uh, Israel's uh, neutrality, which it considers pro-Russian. But the real uh, operational reason, um, lesson that Israel should look at is what happens when uh, a small, relatively small group, such as Wagner or such as the Radwan force that uh, Hezbollah has, suddenly decides to invade. Now, they were, will probably be beaten back, but it will be costly for all parties. Mm -hmm. uh, Yusuf, let's talk about what's happening in Syria uh, and the Kurds, of course, that's a major issue for Turkey. How do you see this uh, changing in a way? Well, uh, since the war in Ukraine broke out uh, in February of uh, 2022, we have seen Russia obviously shift its focus uh, to Ukraine because uh, obviously it's a much higher priority uh, theater of war for itself, uh, especially regarding its national security and its national interests. So uh, yes, there has been a drawdown of uh, military instruments and uh, military capacity of the Russians. And uh, this could provide opportunities for Turkey going forward. Uh, we've most recently seen some drone strikes over the past couple of weeks by the Turks uh, in the areas of Tel Rifat and Membich. Uh, these are areas that had a significant Russian presence. Uh, and these are areas that Turkey normally has not launched drone strikes in the past. So uh, I think this is very important and a sign of things to come that Turkey could quite possibly become more active in regions uh, where there is a Russian presence inside Syria. Now, uh, how much of this is coordinated and cooperated between Moscow and Ankara? That's something that we won't know. But if the Turks are launching drone strikes into these regions, uh, one can either assume that they are getting a green light uh, from the Russians or uh, the Russians don't have the capacity to stop Turkish military operations in that region. And they're giving a green light just so tensions don't uh, spark between the both uh, between Russia and Turkey going forward. But regardless, this is something that uh, is improving Turkey's national security uh, right across from its border. And I think that uh, after the Turkish elections, we saw a lot of talk about migration during uh, the May 14th and May 28th uh, elections. So uh, one could expect Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan that he got mm -hmm. the message from voters. So to be able to solve the migration issue, he needs to create more stability on the other side of the border. More stability will, is going to require more military operations and be able to create that buffer zone that he's always wanted, that 30 to 40 kilometer buffer zone that he's always wanted. Now, to create that again, uh, that's going to require the Russian presence in certain areas either to be evacuated or that Russian presence uh, to be diminished to the point where there's more of a Turkish presence in that region. All right. Marwa? No, I think the exact opposite. Uh, actually, we I just read the report this morning that um, maybe uh, Russia actually conducted some airstrike on the northwestern side of uh, Syria, which is uh, historically or recently been held by under Turkish uh, uh, presence and some uh, influence there, uh, the Islamist groups there. So, in fact, I think one interpretation coming from uh, Arab reports is that uh, uh, Russia might even increase its uh, activities in this northwestern part of Syria, uh, uh, and maybe Turkey will be pushed to actually help Russian uh, leadership on that file, the Islamist uh, jihadist mercenaries there, as opposed to uh, what was uh, described now as if, you know, R Russia would retreat from Syria. In fact, as a response to its presence in uh, uh, Ukraine and all the talk that maybe 
these are impasses in Ukraine with all this, uh, these events with the Wagner Group, maybe actually we might expect that Russia would take some uh, measures, uh, military measures against these groups in Syria as a way of even making up for, for some of these, um, what seems like losses or at least uh, hurting its image in, in Ukraine and even internal within Russia. So I would even expect more uh, escalations on this part of these mercenary jihadists in, in Syria. And now we, the question becomes what we're Erdogan do? Would he actually um, allow for that as a way of saying and communicating with the rest of the region that he's no longer the supporter of all these Islamist factions uh, left and right in the region? And that would be actually a way of him integrating further with the other leaders in uh, in the Gulf and Egypt, etc. So we're yet to see that. J okay. Just very quickly. Yeah, quickly. Very quickly. We're, t we're talking about very g different geographies in Syria, though. I was talking about the Minbich and Talrafat region. Uh, uh, and our guest in, from D.C. is talking more about the northwestern side, an area that's not exactly controlled by Turks, an area that's more under HTS control and some former al-Qaeda uh, affiliate control, where uh, certain Russian escalation actually at times uh, plays into a Turkish interest as well, where Turk the Turks don't want to see these groups get too powerful in that okay, region. Okay, so, point made. Uh, uh, Amir here, final, final point, yeah. Russia is still a nuclear superpower uh, not to be toyed with, but conventionally it's a paper bear. Still. We saw it in Syria, Air Force, we saw it in Ukraine, ground forces. Now we saw it not being able to block the march of 25,000 paramilitary or prisoners or whatever the Wagner uh, personnel yeah. were. Uh, so, which, right. which brings me to uh, the first um, you know, thing we said here, the brand. The That's Russian good. brand, the Putin brand, was uh, actually uh, distorted in a way uh, yesterday. Um, lady and gentlemen, I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.